Just six weeks to go until polling day and our series of leaders interviews begins tonight. Welcome to The View. Tonight, I'll be asking the Alliance leader, Naomi Long, about her party's chances of moving up the Stormont pecking order. We'll hear how two seasoned political observers think Alliance will do on the big day. And as health campaigners battle to make their voices heard in the election campaign, we look at services in the border counties. So having you know, easy access to your GP is much more important than having free access. The questioning, for example, from DUP councillors was very clearly about what would the value of this be in terms of improving the health care. And our health correspondent, Mary Louise Connolly, will join me live with analysis. Hello. In just six weeks' time, the polls will have closed and the politicians will be awaiting their fate. We've invited the five main party leaders to join me in the studio over the course of the campaign. And this week, I'm joined by the Alliance Party leader, Naomi Long. Welcome to you and thank you for joining us in the studio. I haven't seen you in that seat for a couple of years. Indeed. Indeed. Um, let's start with money. Um, yesterday, we had a spring statement from the Chancellor that's been criticised widely for not doing enough to help those individuals who are facing real financial hardship. The day before, we saw a recommendation from the Fiscal Commission here which said Stormont should be given power over income tax in future. In principle, is that a good idea in your view? I think in principle it is, but I think in order to create the conditions where that would be viable, we first of all need stability in terms of our institutions. We need to know that we're going to have consistent government. Um, and I think we need to demonstrate that the powers we already have in terms of revenue raising um, and variation um, of our collection of revenue um, are actually used. And we haven't used those powers to date. So I think it's hard to make a strong case for more unless you're actually willing um, to use the powers that you already have. Uh, it would be a big change if it happened uh, to see local politicians given the power to make decisions around increasing or decreasing taxes for different groups of people here. We know, of course, from previous Alliance manifestos that your party would increase domestic rates for those who can afford it most, as you put it. So is that the approach you'd take on income tax as well? Well, income tax is actually a much fairer tax than rates-based tax because property-based tax doesn't deal with the fact that some people may have large properties um, and low income. Um, it doesn't deal with multiple people residing in a property versus a single person. Um, and so all of that makes things much more difficult. We would much prefer income tax was the main tax um, that people paid according to what they earn. Um, and that is proportionate then to their ability. Um, and that to me seems a much fairer system. But I have to say that when we talk about tax, we shouldn't just be talking about raising taxes. And I think that's the challenge. We also need to look at, for example, the cost of division. We need to look at duplication and waste in the system. And we need to make sure that before we dip into hard-pressed taxpayers' pockets for more, that we are spending what we already have um, properly. And I think that that's really important as well. But I'm interested in the trend here of, of your thinking. Is it the same as it has been in the past? We have seen in previous Alliance election manifestos the idea that um, those who can shoulder more should take a greater proportion of the of burden. Course. Does that continue to be your position? Of course, because it is the only sustainable and fair position to take. I mean, for example, there were those who were arguing in response to the current um, cost of living crisis that we should have a kind of bonanza giveaway where everyone in Northern Ireland would get a voucher towards the cost of living. Now, I understand how in front of an election that might be really popular, but is that really a good use of resource? Because let's be honest, I can afford to heat my home. It will cost me more than it did last year. I will feel the pinch like everybody else, but I will be able to afford to do it. There are other people in this society who can't afford to heat their homes, um, who aren't able to feed their children. And I think we have to target very precious resources that we have in government in terms of public money at those most in need. And I think that that is a fair and equitable way of doing it. At the heart of what Alliance wants to do around, for example, contributions to society, we want them to be fair. So it has to be based on your ability to pay. It has to be clearly demonstrated um, that, for example, when we would make changes to taxes, it would be to take those low-income families out of the tax system by raising the lower um, bands for tax and ensuring that those who earn a lot of money 
um, actually pay a reasonable contribution, and also looking at some of the big corporations who manage to avoid paying tax at all. We need to challenge all of that if we're going to look at tax reform. It's six weeks until the election. We haven't seen your manifesto. It hasn't been published yet. I assume it's coming in the next few weeks. It is. But just to be clear, will you be fighting this election on the basis that you'd like to remove the cap on the most valuable properties, which would mean their owners paying more rates than they currently do? Do you think that is a vote winner for Alliance on May the 5th? Well, it's not about whether it's a vote winner. It's about whether it's the fairest way for us to raise revenue. We were very clear in previous, um, in previous manifestos and indeed in terms of how we approach this one that it must be based on ability to pay, and that's crucial. But we have also argued that the rates-based system is not the fairest way, and that's why we have, for example, been calling on Rishi Sunak um, to look very carefully um, at income tax, to look very carefully, um, particularly at rises in universal credit, to cover those out of work and in work poverty, um, so that they are able to meet the cost of the increasing cost of living. I think that it's right that we should try to bring a fairer society, and we stand over the decisions that we would take in that regard. It's important that people like me, who are well remunerated for our jobs, pay our fair share. I, I think that that is, I think that's something that most people recognise okay. um, and most people accept. Interesting you mentioned the Chancellor there. He also announced yesterday that homeowners will pay 0% VAT on energy saving materials such as solar panels or heat pumps for the next five years. Rishi Sunak said he could make the move thanks to Brexit but of course the policy, as we now know, will not apply to Northern Ireland immediately because of the protocol. Now that is the protocol you wanted to see rigorously implemented. Here's a clear example of how it is disadvantaging homeowners in Northern Ireland? Well, I mean, first of all, despite the spin from Rishi Sunak, um, it's not quite the case. We can, of course, we will get the benefit of that because we will get the Barnet consequentials of it. Um, and we can also um, ask the EU for the ability to lower VAT on those products. Because that that would be already... a million pounds. The Barnet consequential but... is an estimated one million pounds, well... which... Um, it could be spent on anything. It wouldn't necessarily oh, it benefit wouldn't, people no, who it, were putting in energy saving measures in their it homes. It wouldn't necessarily, but that's the kind of that's the kind of decision. If you look at our plan for tackling um, energy costs and energy poverty, one of the things that we said was to make renewables um, and to make sustainable energy a, a better option, a more affordable option for people. So that's one of the options that we would choose were we in that position. But to be clear, we can do it through the EU. Indeed, the EU themselves are dropping VAT on those things. So the idea that being well, out. that's up for discussion. We're not clear well, precisely no, when well, that would happen it, or how. No, but they have said that that's something they're going to do. And I have actually written to the finance minister today to ask him what measures will be taken in the interim to use that money so that we're benefiting the people that it was intended to benefit. Yeah, but that's not across that's the board. There would, there would be a number of areas where there could be 0% VAT and there would be a number of areas where there would be 5% VAT. You'd have to make a decision as to whether or not this would be one of those areas. Of course, and those are the decisions that we are elected to make um, in devolution. Any money that comes to Northern Ireland always comes to us unhypothecated and it is up to us where we decide to invest it and I think that that is right. People here in Northern Ireland elect us as their politicians to make those decisions but when it comes to the protocol let's be really clear about the protocol. I didn't support the protocol because I didn't support Brexit. I opposed Brexit because I believed that it would bring new frictions and new costs into the market, and I believed it would be bad for Northern Ireland, for Europe, and for the UK as a whole. And that was my view, and it remains my view that it is. I voted against the protocol because I said at the time that I thought it was bureaucratic and clunky. Mm. But make no mistake, we're not comparing the protocol with what went before. No. What went before was membership of the EU. That is now gone. But, but and were critics. we to leave without the protocol, were we to leave without the protocol, we would be in a much more disadvantageous situation because we also wouldn't have the withdrawal agreement yeah. and but, a no-deal Brexit but look, you, would have you, been catastrophic. You, you know very well that your critics, most of them unionists as far as this is concerned, would say that you called in September 2020 along with other party leaders for the rigorous implementation of the protocol. Um, you know... Uh, you specifically used that terminology. I wonder if you regret that you weren't more nuanced in your support of the protocol when it was agreed. Because now the EU has shifted from its original position to say that, well, there can be negotiations and there can be changes to make the protocol better if that's what both the EU and the UK government decide. And that was always our position. 
that any changes to the protocol had to be negotiated through the correct mechanism. But you used the that term is rigorous, rigorous implementation. implementation. Mark, that is rigorous implementation. That is following the dispute resolution processes that are part of the protocol, and it is about ensuring that any changes that are made are not unilateral. Remember the time when we issued that statement? It was in response to the Internal Markets Bill, a bill which the Secretary of State admitted would break the law, albeit he said in limited and specific ways, but nevertheless we break the law now. I mean, I'm not only a party leader, I'm also Justice Minister, and I'm not going to stand by while somebody breaks the law. When people commit to doing something, I believe they should stand over it. And our best chance of negotiating a better deal with the EU in terms of reducing the number of checks and the bureaucracy is for there to be trust. Yeah. And you can only build trust by living up to the commitments that you make. Well, I've got the joint statement on the protocol in front of me, and it's very clear all of those qualifications and all of that context is there. But you still use the phrase rigorous implementation. And you as you say... Said, you you could have said full implementation, you could have said flexible implementation, you could have said pragmatic implementation, but the, 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 the word you used was rigorous implementation, and that's come back to haunt you. Well, I mean, it does, of course, from our critics, but I think anyone who reads, as you say, the context that is set in that statement before they read that paragraph will see that the context was a government threatening to break the law, and we did not believe that breaking the law was an option. So, I mean, I believe that the protocol needs to be implemented. You cannot sign it, because here's the consequence. If you don't implement the protocol, first of all, you leave businesses in legal uncertainty and legal jeopardy. Secondly, you create a bonanza for the black market who will exploit any loopholes in the market um, and in the arrangements. And thirdly, you run the risk of the EU actually taking infraction proceedings themselves, okay. which could trigger a trade war, which would drive up costs further. So it is not unreasonable to say to the government, do what you promised you were going to do and get into a room with the EU and have discussions about how we can actually manage the issues. And we did more than that, Mark. We went to our government and to the EU with potential solutions. And those who, who criticise the use of the word rigorous implementation are the very people who drove the hard Brexit, yeah. who but drove... But your critics will say who, you who would have, every you would have settled other option. for an nope. unaltered who took, protocol who took, 14, not, 18 months not ago. Not the case, because yeah, we voted have. against it. Not the case. We voted against it. And even at that time... Time, we were talking to the EU okay. and others about... No, I, this is important. Sure, um, because but I want to needs, talk about other stuff as well. Of course you do, but you've raised this and I want to talk about this because it needs to be clarified. At that time, it was important that we were clear about the law and it was important to deliver that certainty for business okay. with respect to those... Right. Who criticise it? They I, no, I haven't. They okay. they drove hard Brexit. They also drove a situation where there was nothing but the protocol left on the table. Now that the only alternative to the protocol at that time was hard Brexit. Perhaps that's what some people wanted, but I think it would have been right. catastrophic okay. for Northern Ireland. All right, let's let's move on and talk about constitutional matters. Earlier this month, when we were discussing the issue of a future border poll on Sunday politics, you told me, and I quote: "When we take the position, as we undoubtedly, as will undoubtedly happen at some point in the future, it will." be based on facts and evidence. So it's not a case of Alliance not being a nationalist or a unionist party. It's just that you aren't a nationalist or a unionist party yet. Is that it? No. So what did you mean when you said that? Well, exactly what I said, that at the point... I mean, if you're a nationalist or a unionist now, you take an ideological position with respect to the constitutional question. But you will do that eventually, you no, said, when I, the time if, is if, right. If I may answer the mm. question... Um, we don't take an ideological position. What I've said is we will take a position at the time when the question is asked based on facts and evidence. Um, and we will take two decisions in the party. The first decision will be whether or not we decide to campaign as a party in any referendum. And the second decision will be what we would campaign for in that referendum. And those two decisions will be taken not by me, but by the membership of the Alliance Party. I have always said that I would find it strange if the party were not on the basis of a proposition to take a position, yeah. but it will be ultimately up to the people in the Alliance Party to decide whether or not to do that or whether we allow people to decide for themselves within the party um, and our electorate to basically go out and vote for themselves. But ultimately, and this is a crucial point, we keep coming back to this every election to the Assembly, every council election. Where do people stand on the constitutional question? Yeah. It will not be resolved by political parties. It will be a referendum in which every individual person yeah, but in here's Northern the point. Ireland has this a vote. Is a really important so it's point irrelevant. To yeah, no, it's not, it's not it irrelevant, irrelevant if you're looking for votes.
votes in six weeks' time, and you're looking for votes across the board, and people will We're want to know... We're not looking for votes in a referendum. We are looking for votes to sure. enable us to go into Stormont and deliver on the issues that matter to people. Okay, but when in a people referendum, vote for the DUP, people will vote for themselves. When, when people vote for the DUP or the UUP or Sinn Féin or the SDLP, they know precisely what they're getting when it comes to the constitutional question. With Alliance, it seems it's now, frankly, a bit of a lucky dip. Vote for us and we'll let you know where we stand later. Well, I mean, you say it's now a bit of a lucky dip. This has been our position since the mid-90s. So it's not a for now, it's a lucky well, dip. Well, it is for now because it's how just it has been for a very long time. On the I'm 6th well of March, of what when I said. we take a position, as will undoubtedly happen at some point in the future. Yes, and, people and we will could, take well, it. Could be we forgiven for asking it. at the moment. I'd like to know what that position and is. I'm, I'm a small N nationalist or a small U unionist. I'm thinking of voting for the Alliance Party, but I want to know ultimately what you represent. And I have set out what we represent. We represent prioritising building a united community, delivering for the people of Northern Ireland, and we prioritise both of those over and above the constitutional question. And if you're a unionist or a nationalist, you're still free to have those views. But we are saying that our priority as a party, okay. is to drive forward progress in Northern Ireland. And when it comes to a referendum, it won't be the Alliance Party, the DUP or Sinn Féin or any other party that decides the outcome of a referendum. It will be individual voters in the ballot box. They are not voting in a referendum in this election. They are voting for political parties to represent them on the day-to-day -day bread and butter issues, on the cost of living crisis, on the challenges that we have around fuel costs, on schools, on health, um, all of those issues are the ones that we will be grappling with okay. as Assembly Just members. And that's what we are standing on. So make no doubt about it. No one is confused when we knock on their door and ask them to vote alliance. Okay. They know what we stand for. They simply know that it isn't about the constitutional question. That isn't how we define ourselves. Okay. Can I just ask you one last question? Um, uh, there is no guarantee the Assembly will be up and running again on the other side of the election, given the DUP's uh, stated position on the protocol. Um, and even the most optimistic of alliance surges won't be able to resolve that situation on its own. So a good day for you on May the 5th could be, what, 14 or 15 seats and third place on the podium. It's worth remembering that reality amidst, you know, a lot of the hype, isn't it? Well, I mean, first of all, I set no limits on our ambition for the party because I believe that if people in sufficient numbers decide to vote alliance in any constituency, they can return alliance MLAs. And that's what we're asking them to do. So we're going out with a ticket of 24 candidates and we're asking people to back those 24 candidates. So that's the ambition that we have when we go to the, the, to the polls. And I don't set ceilings on that ambition. But irrespective of that, the stronger the alliance vote, the more influence we have in terms of the shape of any assembly to come. And this is crucial yeah. because we want institutional reform. Yeah. The time has gone now yeah. when any party, unionist, nationalist, Sinn Féin, DUP, should be able to take our institutions and hold them to ransom. We had three years of it and just passed. We're only two years on and now we're seeing it again. Okay. That needs to stop and the easiest way for that to stop is for people to make a strong alliance showing because that will demonstrate that the duopoly that has run Northern Ireland for many years is no longer the choice of everyone in Northern Ireland yeah. and that will but allow for reform. You've got to accept one final point. That is the a case good, for a good day on May the 5th for you would be the bronze medal, not the gold medal. Well, let's wait and see because no other party, let's remember, not a vote has been cast. It's six weeks until votes will be counted but not a vote has been cast everything is still to play for and a good day for alliance will be a good day for northern ireland okay. all right we need to leave it there um, we're out of time naomi long thanks very much indeed for coming in to join us and in the run-up to the election we hope to hear from all the other political parties let's hear what Fanula o'connor and sam mcbride make of what we have uh, just heard um, welcome to both of you and thanks for uh, joining us on the program Fanula, first of all how do you sum up the challenges that the alliance party faces in this election well, one of the challenges they don't face is people not knowing what they're about. Because with all due respect, Mark, to you pounding away there on the old constitutional line, I think Naomi Long sets the bar very high as, uh, as someone who sets out her stall really clearly. Um, so that's not a challenge they face. It is a challenge that some of the others face, and it's a challenge that uh, some don't look like they have any chance of overcoming. Sam, um, can you see that 2019 surge, those gains in the local elections for Alliance, taking that Westminster seat, that brief spell in Brussels before Brexit being replicated in six weeks' time? I think that was a hugely significant moment because it basically confirmed not only that the key trend from the oh, Good Friday Agreement was... Oh, thank you. 
Sorry, it, it, it not only confirmed that the key trend from the Good Friday Agreement was the move towards centrist parties, parties that are not aligned on the constitutional question, but it also basically confirmed that Northern Ireland now effectively has three tribes. It has three camps. There are unionists, nationalists and other. Um, and I think there is every reason to believe that will continue into this election. The one reason that that might not happen or might not happen to the same extent, I think, is this question around the protocol. I think that is, to a certain extent, Naomi Long's Achilles heel here. It was what she seemed most uncomfortable on there, and this question about rigorous implementation with some softer unionist-type voters, um, I think they will be at least potentially uncomfortable about aspects of that. Um, do, do you think the constitutional question is an issue for Alliance at this election or not, if it is looking for first preference votes, but critically transfers from both nationalists and Unionists, if it's going to win as many seats as some people say it might, maybe 14 or 15, it's going to need a lot of transfers. I don't think that Alliance has ever had any great difficulty getting transfers. It has got transfers from both sides of the spectrum, and that's one of its great strengths. And I, I, I also don't really think that there's any great difficulty in voters understanding what Alliance stands for on the constitutional question. Voters who vote Alliance vote for it because they're not um, clear on this question. They like that. They like that agnosticism. So I think that is a strength for Alliance, not a weakness at this point. Yeah, although, and although on Fenula, that I mean, I was just going to, I was just going to reference those comments that um, uh, Naomi Long made to me on the sixth of March, two and a half weeks ago, uh, when she was on Sunday Politics, when she said, uh, you know, wh when we take a position on this issue, as we inevitably will in due course. So that was suggesting that the party would have to come down on one side or the other, um, if and when we have a border poll. Well, that uh, uh, that doesn't seem to me to be the big question. Uh, Mark, I, I don't think Sam's right that uh, the protocol is what will be f f hard centre of voters' minds. I think the protocol is greatly overstated and overrated by unionists, the unionists who pound away at it. But uh, the, the unionist voters may not be nearly, and I don't think they are, polls suggest they're not nearly as exercised as the politicians are. So I, I think the, the constitutional question you're right uh, in to go after it, of course, um, and people will make up their minds about that. But Sam, where I disagree with him on the protocol, I would agree with him on the on people liking the agnosticism. Where I thought she really scored, Naomi really scored there, was uh, in, in emphasising context. She was effectively sa and saying it will be for the people to decide. She was saying we can't say where we're going to be at the moment, because we don't know what it's going to be like when a referendum is called. We don't know what the context of that will be. And that might dissatisfy lots of unionists in particular. It may dissatisfy a lot of nationalists as well. But if there really is a third tribe, uh, and I doubt at myself that it is all that solid a, 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 an animal, um, I think they might like that. They might like to hear Yes, we don't know yet. We want the discussion. We want to hear Ireland's future says this all the time. We've got to start the debate. We've got to start the discussion. So, think... so let, let me ask you this, Fenilla. If, sure. if you don't think Sam's right about saying that the protocol is the Alliance Party's Achilles heel and you think the constitutional issue isn't a huge problem because um, Naomi Long deals with it in the way that she deals with it, what, what do you think is the Alliance Party's Achilles heel in six weeks' time? I don't think it has to have an Achilles heel. Uh, I mean, I, I think it may be fleet-footed and uh, charging away there. I mean, Naomi Long is a warrior woman. Her health risk, her health, her health problems. They, they, she's had a hard COVID. She comes through. She's on top of detail. She makes an awful lot of other politicians sound feeble on detail. Um, she's enormously popular. She may be the she may be the winning thing. She may be the, she's the opposite of an Achilles heel. Um, if the protocol really were to, to bring anybody down, I think it's more likely to bring the DUP down than Alliance. Okay. Sam, did, did, did you laugh there when Fadilla said that maybe the Alliance Party doesn't have an Achilles heel? Well, um, I think that everybody has a weakness. Um, I think that if Alliance didn't have a weakness, they would be a much bigger party than, than, than they are. But I, I do agree that Naomi Long is a huge asset to the party. She's hugely capable. Um, they would be a great deal poorer without her. But I do think that in calling for rigorous implementation of a protocol which could have been pragmatically implemented, it could have been um, done in a light touch way, in a soft way, that is what's happening now. Um, so it's not actually Alliance policy okay. to rigorous 
rigorously implemented. But that's nerdish, Sam. That's nerdish talk. Well, it and I don't think that really is what people think when they're going into a ballot box. OK, Sam, final sentence and then we're done. It matters to people who are wanting to buy particular products that they simply can't get if it's rigorously implemented. OK, we need to leave it there, folks. Thanks both very much indeed. Very interesting to hear your thoughts. Um, now, it's hard to tell at this stage to what extent health reform will figure in the election campaign, but its ultimate success or failure will very probably affect all of us. Last week, Dublin academics published a report on the health services in both jurisdictions and how well patients are served. And this week, we saw the launch of a cancer strategy here. Meanwhile, the decision on moving emergency surgery from Newry to Craigavon is the latest development that's got people worried about about local health services. Our health correspondent, Mary Louise Connolly, is with me now. Evening to you, Mary Louise. Tell us more about uh, what the Esri report uh, in the Republic said last week, first of all. Yeah, well, the Esri report is the Economic, Social and Research Institute. And on this occasion, their task was to examine and compare primary health care services, north and south. And one key distinction that it found was the lack of a universal health care system across the island of Ireland. It's a small island, but despite that, the reporters said that uh, there was quite a lot of big differences between the two. Here in Northern Ireland, of course, people expect uh, a free health care service, and that's what they get. The big difference in the Republic is, of course, that they have to pay for a lot of their services, including going to see uh, a GP. But despite that big difference, the report also found that both systems are facing similar challenges, such as spiralling hospital waiting lists, workforce shortages and increasing expenditure. Now, the report wasn't uh, expected to find a conclusion whether there should be a universal health care on all island system. They said that Sadly, at this stage, the data wasn't just present in order for them to form a conclusion. And Ryan Louise, just briefly on this one, the, the angle of north-south cooperation around health services was also mentioned for people around the border, and that's what they might think works for them. Yes, exactly. And it does. There is clear evidence that there is good work happening uh, across border areas. But I think a lot of clinicians would hope that in the future those services will expand and that they will get better. Okay, Maya Louise, for now, thank you. We'll hear from you again um, very shortly. But first, Julian Fowler has been taking a look at services on both sides of the border for us. I was here first thing this morning and there was a great sense of anticipation as staff waited for the first patients to arrive. And by lunchtime, the move had been complete and the urn hospital closed. Staff and patients are now settling into their new surroundings and the Southwest Acute Hospital has become fully operational. I was here when the Southwest Acute Hospital opened its doors 10 years ago. There were high hopes in the community that it would ensure the continued delivery of a full range of healthcare services on their doorstep. But this brand new state-of-the-art building hasn't always met those expectations. Five years ago, hundreds of people protested against plans that threatened the future of the local stroke unit. Diane Little has campaigned for better access to health services in Fermanagh for more than 20 years. Buildings don't deliver services. It should not see services that are time critical, acute care, A&E, maternity, stroke, all of those services which are time critical. They should not be moving from the southwest region. You know, that's over 100,000 people being served by this hospital um, and, and it was built to serve peripheral communities, you know, on the border area as well to make services um, accessible. In recent months, the number of cots in the neonatal unit in Enniskillen has been cut from six to two due to a shortage of specialist nurses, with mothers and sick babies transferred as far away as Dublin. The services are on a shoestring, and you know they're documenting the serious risks from that on maternity services as well. That that's that is going to increase mortality rates. You're travelling from different parts of Fermanagh. You know, you're two hours away from, from vital time critical health care, whether you're having a stroke, whether you're having a baby, whether you're, you know, whatever the health emergency, it could be, a, you know, whatever serious matter is happening, you know, see, so you're going to see an increase in mortality. There have been countless reports on the need to transform the way health services are delivered, but Diane Little says their conclusions are being ignored. They make recommendations and they're even going right down to the culture within an organisation. So those alarm bells are ringing in all of these documented reports. They're being ignored and we urgently need 
an independent public review now before we need a public inquiry that will expose all of the catalogue of failures that are leading to an increase in mortality here. Despite the quality of life of living and working here, the Western Trust has continued to struggle with recruitment. There are currently 12 full-time consultant vacancies at the Southwest Acute Hospital. It's a similar story in GP surgeries, with the closure of rural practices when doctors retire. We've had some local doctors retire in the last four or five years from small uh, neighbouring practices, and it was impossible to get any applicants to come and take over from those doctors when they retired. So uh, we were asked by uh, the Health and Social Care Board to, as a practice here in Lisnesky to take on all those extra patients. And unfortunately, we were unable to secure really enough medical personnel to, to keep the proportion of uh, patients to doctors uh, as it had been before. So it has been a pressurised time. Patients across Northern Ireland have found it difficult to see a GP during the COVID pandemic. Across the border in Donegal, you don't have to wait long for an appointment, but most people will have to pay. Easy access to your GP is much more important than having free access. But imagine it would be rare that you have to wait for more than a day and a half to see your GP. Northern General Practice is under-resourced. They don't have enough GPs. And having to wait several weeks for to see your, your uh, GP is frustrating for the, the doctors, but is really critically n negative impact on the health of the people in Northern Ireland. Covid has exposed pressures in the healthcare systems on both sides of the border. Campaigners for an all-Ireland NHS believe there should be closer cooperation. It became really clear during Covid that to have two separate health systems on an island this small really made no sense at all. It really exposed the problems with our health services north and south. Very similar health, very similar challenges, very similar problems north and south. Not enough beds any of any kind, not enough ICU beds, not enough doctors, not enough nurses. You know, all of those issues really came to the fore during the pandemic. You brought this campaign to a, a number of councils in um, Northern Ireland. Um, were you surprised by the response that you got? I um, actually addressed, you know, remotely like this, um, the uh, Fermanagh, uh, for Oman Fermanagh District Council, um, and was very surprised by um, the way that parties right across the spectrum um, engaged um, and could see the value so that, you know, from... The questioning, for example, from DUP councillors was very clearly about what would the value of this be in terms of improving the health care that's available for their constituents, you know, rather than seeing it as some big bogeyman that is going to damage the union in some way. One cross-border success story has been the Northwest Cancer Centre in Altlegalvin. Over the last five years, it's treated more than 4,200 patients, including 850 from the Republic. One of my best friends, to be honest, um, ha uh, had breast cancer um, and was able to have most of her treatment um, here in Alta Gavin, although she lives in Donegal. Um, and so what it meant was that initially she was seeing doctors in Galway University Hospital, which is a fair trek from Donegal. Um, and that's where she had her operation and that. Um, but once she had um, you know, been, got into the system, had the operation, she was then able to get um, her radiotherapy um, here in Altnagelvin, which was a 20 minute drive as opposed to you know, a four hour drive. So it does make a big difference to people on the ground. But change to healthcare will require political change in Belfast and Dublin. The standard of care is very similar. The degree of expertise is certainly tremendous and, and, and we're very grateful for those people that we have working, looking after our patients. So. There, wouldn't, there shouldn't be any quality impact for patients and nothing to fear from that. I suppose it's really all about is there a political will. Julian Fowler reporting there. Mary Louise Connolly is still with me. Mary Louise, first of all, what are the similarities between the two health services? Well, on both sides of the border, uh Health and Social Care command the biggest allocation of the, the budget. Similarly, it's often the most contentious area within government. I think health and social care is as politicised in the north as it is in the south. The same promises are made, particularly at election time, about what can be promised. But 
in the same way the, the promises are, are, aren't fulfilled and, and people are let down uh, post-election because they simply can't deliver. And despite being so small in size, there isn't an all-Ireland health strategy in place and certainly a lot of work is going on behind the scenes. The feeling is keep politics out of it and then we can get it done. But I think the feeling is a lot more could be happening. And in your view, could cross-border cooperation work better? It, of course, it could work better. The problem is, as I've said, it does become more politicised. I think the main sticking point is is how the whole thing can be funded. But there are those who say those hurdles can be uh, crossed. For instance, a Northern Ireland patient could avail of a service in Dublin, for instance, in St Thomas's Hospital. Then the Northern Ireland Health Service could be billed for that service uh, and vice versa. Take adult cardiac surgery in Northern Ireland and um, that is outsourced to Dublin every year but that is always done on a short term basis. I know many consultants feel it would be better if there was um, a proper partnership between uh, Dublin and Belfast but there is this feeling once we go down that road some people feel that this is the beginning of a united Ireland and therefore it's best not to deal with it. Um, we, we started the programme talking about elections. That's what everybody's going to be talking about on the airwaves over the next six weeks. We have repeatedly on this programme and on Sunday Politics asked the parties about their elected representatives avoiding parish pump when it comes to objecting to services changing in their areas. Now, the parties say they don't want to see that happening. They, they don't think that's a good idea. But already we can all see politicians who are looking for votes on May the 5th making noises about saving local services. Of course, and that has always been the case uh, in Northern Ireland's history. We saw this most recently when the SDLP's Justin McNulty raised concerns about uh, Daisy Hill losing its uh emergency general surgery and while Justin was raising concerns in the assembly I know at the same time um, healthcare leaders and clinicians were raising their eyes because simply Northern Ireland doesn't have the workforce that can be stretched across several sites so there is this talk now of could sites not only across Northern Ireland but across the island of Ireland, Ireland be sharing staff be sharing resources it does make good financial sense but only if politics is taken out of it. Bengoa has said it, Slauncher is looking at it as well. Politics always seems to get in the way. And in the meantime, Mary Louise, just finally, the health professionals, and you talk to them all the time, say change, transformation, however challenging it might be on the ground, simply has to happen. It has to happen. It is falling off the edge. We just cannot sustain the, the waiting lists that need to be fulfilled. People are, are becoming sicker as they wait in those hospital waiting lists. A discussion needs to be had. When you ask politicians in, in an open forum at all, oh yes, you know, but particularly it'll be interesting in the next six weeks to see what they say on the doorstep and then, you know, how people will vote, will people vote for change and then what happens afterwards and how, if we have a, a, a new assembly and a new executive, how they will deal with it. So that's a warning to the politicians from you. You'll be keeping a very close eye on what they say and what they do. <laughs> Always. OK. Mary Louise, thanks very much indeed. Um, that's just about it. Before we go, a quick reminder about our Red Lines podcast. We're profiling all 18 constituencies ahead of the election on May the 5th, which is uh, six weeks away today. This week, it's for Manor South Tyrone, West Tyrone and Mid-Ulster in that conversation. And indeed, all previous episodes of Red Lines are available now on BBC Sounds or wherever you get your podcasts. In the meantime, I'll be back with Sunday Politics at 10 o'clock on BBC One and I'll be joined in studio by the SDLP leader Colm Eastwood, fresh from his party's annual conference this weekend. Do join me for that. But we leave you with Michael Spicer and his take on one of the big stories of the week from all of us. Thanks for watching. Good night. BBC, yeah, I want to complain about your coverage of the uh, freed hostage. OK, what's your complaint? Well, she wasn't grateful enough. OK, if you're going to be let into this country... Let back into this country. Let back into this country, then you need to show a little bit of gratitude to the people who let you come over here. Come back over here. Come back over here, OK? It's, it's nothing to do with race, OK? It's nothing to do with race. All right. I just think that these people need to show a bit more appreciation. These people? These hostages need to show a bit more appreciation when they come over here. Come back over come here. Come back over here. And why does she look so healthy, by the way? Hostages are supposed to be malnourished and upset. She was glowing and articulate. How do we know she wasn't just sunning herself for six years, having a jolly, you know? They're shifty, these lot. That's the problem. These lot? These... these hostages.
And I, I, I just think that you've got to do things in a more British way when you come over it. Come back over here. Come back over it. Look, can, can you stop correcting me, please? It's so annoying. I'm, I'm sorry, this line is really racist. Can I call you back?